Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Mary Corey, Education Specialist for WorldLink Medical, and I will be moderating today's event. I would like to mention a few quick items before we begin. First of all, please make note of the features available to you within your GoTo Internet browser in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. You should see the chat box where you can enter your questions to Dr. Rosier. They will be answered at the end of the presentation as time allows. This web conference is brought to you by WorldLink Medical. We provide evidence-based CME accredited education in preventive medicine and age management with a focus in bioidentical hormones. Coming up this November, we will have a new membership program that includes the monthly webinars, monthly journal club, and research library access through EBSCOhost. This is a great opportunity to learn what new research articles are coming out that affect hormone therapy and to stay informed on the latest changes that affect your medical practice. Our first journal club meeting is scheduled for November. More information coming soon. If you need to get your hours for certification, please consider registering for an upcoming course. Our lodging accommodations are full for the Hormones and Beyond workshop, but the meeting still has room. If you would still like to attend, contact Dana directly for alternate arrangements. Check the websites for dates for the remainder of the year for Parts 3 and 4. If you have registered for Part 2, we are working with our National Marriott Rep and should have an update later today for you. As of today, September 12th, both Fort Lauderdale and Palm Beach airports are open. Part 1 is scheduled for January 26th, 27th, and 28th in Salt Lake City. Registration will be posted soon. Today's event is sponsored by an educational grant from MedQuest Pharmacy. We're grateful for their continued support in recognizing the importance of patient and prescriber education in the field of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. They are true leaders in the industry, and we are proud to be sponsored by them. Dr. Neil Rosie A. is our speaker today and is a pioneer and recognized leader in bioidentical hormone replacement field, treating more than 3,000 patients almost since its inception in the early 1990s with over 17 years of experience as an educator and practicing physician. It is my privilege to welcome Dr. Neil Rosier for today's webinar from his hometown in Palm Springs, California. Hello, Neil. Hi, Mary. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's still morning here, 11 o'clock in sunny Palm Springs, where it's supposed to be 105 today. I hope everyone in the South and Midwest has recovered from the hurricanes. I make a special request that you send any amount of water that you have to us. We're still needing water here in California. Anyway, the um, impetus today um, comes from a couple different things. Um, number one, there's uh, unfortunately um, cases that I have to review um, and there's constantly this criticism about the patient didn't qualify for therapy because the levels weren't low enough and number two, when you treated the patient the levels were too high. Um, I see this constant criticism primarily from the endocrine world and the endocrinologist. And I want to address those issues and concern. Um, recently, there has been um, the change in total testosterone levels uh, based on one study by a couple people. And Quest and LabCorp have now adopted those new standards based on one study. And I would like to address those numbers and what numbers that I go by in the game that I play as opposed to the game that they play. So in looking at the um, objectives, um, I want to discuss how I dose, monitor, and prescribe hormones, um, which is based on the medical literature and the articles that I will present today, um, as opposed to the um, Endocrine Society and the recent guidelines based on the recent FDA changes in the um, approval for use of testosterone, I will 
look at when to test, when not to test, and look at numbers and what the numbers really mean. Um, I'll also look at the FDA guidelines versus the AMA guideline using testosterone for off-label use, which is typically what most of us do. I will also explain to you how I successfully treat patients and I treat symptoms. I follow numbers, but I treat symptoms. But yet, we get painted into the corner by our various medical societies that we have to stick by numbers because we're number people, but unfortunately then we ignore patients and their symptoms. And I will explain based on the literature how to get around that. Uh, I remember a long time ago that I got into this discussion with Mark Gordon as to which test is the best. And I'm going to review which test is the best, which test is not the best. And for those of you that know me, you probably have not picked up on the amount of sarcasm that I've already gone over in my questions and my answers looking at the objectives. Because everyone wants to know what is the best test. No, this is the test. No, that's the test. I'll show you what the best test is and why. Sorry, I have a computer glitch on my end. So I'm going to review all of these various topics and use the medical literature as I typically do to show why I do what I do and give a sort of an evidence-based response. And I typically have to explain and testify for doctors either in medical board situations or malpractice situations, which is very unfortunate. And a lot of this talk has to do with how to prepare yourself and how to document well and how to use everything that the medical literature provides in order to explain and defend why we do what we do. So this first article is a nice article from the uh, Canadian Medical Association Journal uh, on the diagnosis of hypogonadism or andropause in men, looking at current guidelines in Canada, which are a little bit different than the guidelines down here. The clinical diagnosis of testosterone deficiency syndrome can be challenging because clinicians frequently face situations in which the laboratory results remain inconclusive in the presence of symptoms. Because we are unfortunately painted into a corner that, well, the patient has symptoms, but they don't qualify because of the numbers. This is absolutely ridiculous. All through medicine, we treat to make patients better, make them healthy, and help control symptoms. The only two circumstances where endocrine guidelines go against doing that are with thyroid and with testosterone. It's very fascinating that we can look at patients that have symptoms that will improve and their health will improve, but we want to deny that to a patient based on a number. They don't qualify. I can't tell you the number of times that I've seen, quote, the medical experts, um, and I use that term sparingly because I really truly think they are not medical, medical experts. They're, they're doing based, they're testifying based on a restrictive guideline that's intended to be restrictive, which is really a shame. We look at those guidelines of these numbers and we ignore the patients. And this talk is primarily about the numbers are meaningless. So what do you do when the patient has symptoms, but the numbers remain inconclusive, laboratory results remain inconclusive? Well, what do we, exactly what we were taught in school was use a number as a guide to our therapy. Don't use it to restrict. Don't use it to deny the patient getting adequate treatment to control their health and their symptoms based on a number. It's just ludicrous that we do this. Thus, it's been suggested that in the presence of a convincing clinical picture, i.e. symptomatology, but uncertain laboratory results, that a therapeutic trial of testosterone supplementation is an acceptable diagnostic approach. Numerous studies support that. Numerous support studies show that don't deny treatment to a patient based on a number, but yet we want to get, we, we end up getting painted into the corner with this number and realize that the number is designed to restrict 
And why would we restrict prescribing a medicine for a person that makes them better and makes their health better? It's just ludicrous that someone would use a number to restrict, but that's exactly what the FDA does. That's exactly what AAC does, and that's exactly what the Endocrine Society does, which is really a shame. So I always document in my notes, and I suggest that you do this too, that if a patient is not qualified based on a number, that, and I write that in my note, the patient does not qualify based on FDA guidelines, but beyond the FDA guidelines, the patient has symptoms, and I always make sure that I document those symptoms. I've listed the symptoms here just so that you can document those, and I do this. I always say patient complains of you know, loss of sexual function, a lock, uh, loss of erectile function, fatigue, loss of energy, um, loss of general feeling of well-being, uh, increased body fat, depression, mood swings, irritability. I document those complaints, and I also document the patients requesting testosterone in order to control these symptoms and these complaints. The summary here is nice. The goal of testosterone treatment is improvement in symptoms and the achievement of eugonadal levels, which is vague, in the middle range for healthy young men. Now, that's going to vary based on laboratory, reagent, test, etc., and I'll get into how meaningless numbers are. But again, it's nice to show that, well, the, the patient didn't qualify because the level's 301. It doesn't matter. What we're trying to do is get their levels into the mid-normal range of a young adult, and the labs that are published, the ranges that are published are for older men, not for younger men. So we use optimal levels, the upper end of the range of normal for a young, healthy male. That's where we want to be. If it's so important to have levels there because it helps our health, then that's where our levels should be, and we should, we should not restrict that. But again, most important is improvement of symptoms. Last paragraph, because there's large variations between individuals and symptom improvement should be our primary goal, higher or lower concentrations in the lab test um, may be acceptable in patients with a positive response to treatment. I can't believe the number of times that I've seen doctors reduce the dose of the testosterone based on they think that the number is too high when they tested it. I will start here and say, in the guidelines for AACE, it states that numbers should be monitored, levels should be monitored. Does it tell you when you should monitor them? No, it just says monitor them. Well, don't you think it should be important that they say when? Well, it's different because the half-life is different from creams, gels, patches, shots, pellets. Don't you think there should be some guidelines as to when they test? No. So you can test anytime you want, and if the level's high, well, you test it too soon. If the level's too low, well, then you'll test it too late. Where in these guidelines does it say when to test people? It doesn't. So when should it be done? Again, it's nebulous. Yeah, you should do it, but there's no guidelines as to when you should do it or how you interpret it. Too bad. So let's look at this, a couple articles looking at the paradox Dividing Testosterone Symptomatology in Androgen Assays. Central to the diagnosis and treatment of testosterone deficiency syndrome in the adult male is the remarkable paradox that there's very co poor correlation between symptoms and levels of androgens. There is absolutely no study to show that numbers correlate with symptoms. There's absolutely no study that shows that what number needs to be achieved in order to treat those symptoms and improve those symptoms. It's completely nebulous. So again, AACE tries to paint you into a corner or the endocrine society or endocrinologists trying to paint you in the corner of, well, you know, they want to look at numbers. They want to look at numbers to restrict or to criticize. But there's absolutely no correlation between symptoms and numbers. We should not try to achieve a certain number. What we should do is try to achieve a symptom. If you want to achieve a number, Okay, fine, but when do you test that number? It doesn't say. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid and wanted to play games, and we always had to go by rules. Well, what we did was we made our own game and we made our own rules, and we abided by our own rules, not by somebody else's rules, and that's simply what I do. 
I use the medical literature to support why I do what I do and to treat based on symptom and improvement of quality of life. Unfortunately, AACE, the medical societies, don't look at numbers are meaningless, and this is why. Because if you focus just on a number, then you won't be able to treat symptoms. There's various factors that govern whether a patient is going to feel better or not. So let's look at a couple of those different things. Impaired androgen synthesis. Well, that's pretty obvious. As we get older, our levels fall. When our levels are low, then we're not going to see any improvement in how we feel and we have, how we function. It will have a compromise in our long-term health. Well, all hormones are that way. When the levels fall, then we have adverse effects. But what's new and different about testosterone is we're now starting to realize and understand it can be bound by albumin. It can also be bound heavily by sex hormone binding globulin. Albumin binds it weakly. Sex hormone binding binds it strongly. There's also decreased tissue responsiveness or binding at the receptor site. So you do have it free roaming in the system, not bound. But even that hormone does not attach to the receptor site because of some sort of alteration in the structure of that receptor site. And therefore, the level is good, but the patient doesn't see improvement in symptoms because the hormone can't bind to the receptor site. We know this by other hormones that don't bind, like insulin resistance. There's also decreased androgen receptor activity. So it does bind onto the receptor site, but it doesn't stimulate the receptor site. It needs to work like a lock and key. You can put the key into the lock, but you can't turn the lock. It's bound on the receptor site, but it's not doing anything. And of course, even if it's bound on the receptor site, you have decreased signal transduction and translation onto the mRNA and decreased protein formation inside the cell at the mRNA because the receptor site is resistant to sending that signal inside the cell. So all of these things play a role in symptomatology, health, wellness, and the function of the hormone. And we completely ignore these other things because we focus purely on the level, the synthesis and the level of it, and we completely ignore all of these other factors, which is really a shame. Different article stated differently. As with insulin and maturity onset diabetes, there can be both insufficient production, the levels fall, and various degrees of resistance at the cell level to the action of androgens operating at several levels in the body simultaneously. And these factors all add up to progressively worsening symptoms. And this happens as we get older. All of these factors worsen as we get older, in addition to lifestyle, other disease processes, and of course, a multitude of different medications, which we'll get into, statins, and of course, narcotics. I know a couple of you are concerned about your patients that are on narcotics. There's actually a couple studies out there showing how harmful narcotics are to one, production of testosterone, two, the binding of the testosterone, and three, the signal transduction inside the cell. And there's one or two nice articles showing that patients will not be able to get off of or taper off of their narcotics unless they have adequate testosterone supplementation. Notice I didn't say levels, I said supplementation. It's gonna be impossible to get those people off drugs. And with the cholesterol medicines cutting our testosterone levels in half, we'll look at that in Beyond Hormones. The majority of the people out there are taking statins, which will cut their testosterone levels in half. And that will have certainly an adverse effect that has nothing to do with what we usually use as these numbers in deciding whether somebody qualifies or not. Androgen deficiency can be redefined as an absolute or relative deficiency of androgens according to the needs of that individual at that time of his life. Translation, numbers are meaningless. It has to do with how receptive that receptor site is and the signal transduction inside the cell that results in symptomatic improvement and it has nothing to do with levels. The paradox is that these characteristic symptoms of deficiency or signs of deficiency like obesity correlate poorly with total testosterone levels and other androgen levels in the blood. Total testosterone is typically what we use because that's what's the easiest and simplest. Um, but as Dr. Kern from Hawaii suggests, don't use total testosterone, and we'll get into that and explain why. Hi, David. 
uh, he brought up an important point as to, yes, we tend to focus on total, but not the free or the bioavailable. And, of course, that's what the important one is to measure. No relationship was found between symptomatology and any battery of eight endocrine assays, including total testosterone and including free testosterone. But the free testosterone is, of course, so much more accurate than the total because the total can be bound loosely to albumin and tightly to sex hormone binding globulin. So all the literature shows we really should be looking at free testosterone, but yet all the guidelines look at total testosterone. Completely worthless. Because of the high sensitivity but low specificity of questionnaires to detect testosterone deficiency syndrome, the complexity of factors involved in androgen resistance and receptor site and signal transduction, and the invalidity of androgen assays because they vary from lab to lab, reagent to reagent, it seems logical to adopt the suggestion that was recommended by all the suggestions recommended by Dr. Black. Which were when the typical symptoms or conditions known to be related to androgen deficiency occur, that we really need to look at a therapeutic trial of testosterone therapy can be given. And of course, as Morgenthal and everyone else suggest, these patients improve. I've never seen anyone not improve with an adequate amount of replacement. The problem with some of you are, at least from what I see from feedback, is, well, we tested them and we didn't see that much improvement. The current guidelines say, well, if you don't see any improvement, then stop. Well, Ruzier's guidelines said, you just simply didn't give enough. One of the topics we'll be addressing at Beyond Hormones is, there's quite a few studies out there showing that testosterone does not work. Well, it doesn't work because what they used was worthless, the levels that they achieved were worthless, and they have no clue or concept or understanding that it's receptor site resistance and loss of signal transduction inside the cell that's responsible. So when your cholesterol medicine doesn't work, lousy example, well, then you increase the dose. When your pain medicine doesn't work, well, then you increase the dose. When your antidepressant doesn't work, again, another lousy example, well, then you increase the dose. Well, when your testosterone level doesn't work, they, they say, well, then stop it. Well, no, you need to increase the dose. But yet everyone's afraid because, well, the numbers look, already look okay. Well, then why did you measure the number? Well, I wanted to see where it was. Well, that's great. But you also have to understand numbers do, do not coincide or correlate with symptoms. So this coincides with the emerging view that an emphasis and reliance on serum testosterone alone hinder, hinders the clinician's ability to manage testosterone deficiency syndrome. You're not going to see improvement unless you get the level up high enough, unless you prescribe enough of it. And it has nothing to do with a number. Low total testosterone is just the tip of the iceberg of androgen deficiency, but yet we get painted into the corner as that is the gold standard. It should not be the gold standard based on this paper and a multitude of others. It is also further than unusual. Uh, it even goes further than usual in giving the patient the benefit of the doubt, which inevitably arises in the doctor's mind. What do you do? When do you treat or not treat based on symptoms or numbers and you you don't use symptoms to restrict therapy you use the number to restrict therapy I've never used a number to restrict therapy and I'll explain why but symptoms are really what drives the decision to treat and not a number the number is a guide to the therapy in addition it may often be increased resistance to androgen action at the cell level resulting from increased binding or any other androgen receptor polymorphism. There's various polymorphisms that have been described that there's plenty of testosterone in the system, but the patient doesn't feel well. Well, that's because various polymorphisms do not allow that signal transduction to take place. There's a multitude of other metabolic factors at the cellular level also that we see with other hormones which can usually be multifactorial source of the problem. The patient's not feeling well or didn't see a response to your therapy because you didn't give enough because of the receptor site resistance. Well then, how do you fix that? You have to put more in the system. Yeah, but then the levels are too high. <laughs> but what about the symptoms? Well, you have to treat the symptoms, but use the number as a guide to your therapy. In all of the courses that I've been teaching over the years, I've shown you where the numbers are, and I'll get to those slides at the end of this talk, 
where the numbers need to be in order to be able to affect change. Neither of these commonly used questionnaires that typically the ATOM score can predict low testosterone levels with any degree of specificity. In a recent study of both, no relationship was found between symptomatology, any one of the tests, or even these questionnaires. So use the lab as a guide. Use the questionnaires as a guide, but look at symptoms and look at aesthetics. Look at the patient and see if they would benefit. Neither are total or free testosterone levels, nor bioavailable testosterone, the definitive measures of androgen deficiency that the endocrinologist would like them to be. Yet they use those numbers to restrict thyroid use, and they use those numbers to restrict testosterone use. And yet the literature shows that these numbers don't correlate. Interpretation of the results according to an arbitrary and inappropriate, quote, normal level can combine to invalidate decisions made on androgen assays we really should give priority to symptoms and signs and use a number to assist on our diagnosis but not use it to restrict. Nice article which shows that. It is an inconvenient truth that one man may have total and free testosterone levels that lie anywhere within the normal reference range and still have symptoms which respond to therapy. A patient can have a low level response to therapy. Patients can have a high level of testosterone and still respond to therapy. Patients can have low levels of testosterone and have no symptoms. Should you treat those? If they have a metabolic disorder and signs that will improve, then yes. If they have symptoms, yes. Any sign or symptom that the patient has that will improve is when I treat and I don't restrict based on a number. It coincides with the emerging view that the lack of correlation between the clinical picture in the most commonly used biochemical confirma confirmatory test, again, total and free testosterone, clearly points to the paramount importance of the clinical evaluation. And by clinical evaluation, I mean signs and symptoms. An emphasis on relier and reliance on total testosterone levels hinders the clinician's ability to manage testosterone deficiency syndrome. I had to defend a case six months ago where the, quote, expert endocrinologist stated that the patient did not qualify for treatment. The patient weighed over 300 pounds. I presented 30 articles showing that testosterone results in significant weight loss, blood sugar control, lowering of cholesterol, raising of HDL. And I was able to get the, quote, um, I was able to get the endocrinologist to state the patient didn't qualify for that, and in turn we asked the endocrinologist, so you don't want the patient to lose weight. Well, he didn't qualify for it. You don't want the patient's cholesterol to be lower. He didn't qualify for it. It made the endocrinologist look like an idiot based on all the literature and studies that I showed that the patient would get better, and they did get better based on the therapy, and no other doctor did anything to help lower the patient's cholesterol, lower their blood sugar, and lower their weight other than giving them cholesterol medicine, which had no effect on their weight whatsoever. It was only the physician that prescribed the testosterone that resulted in significant weight loss, but yet the endocrinologist said he didn't qualify for it. Didn't qualify for weight loss and better cardiovascular protection? No. Well, um, the endocrinologist and the experts look like fools because what they stated was completely against what the medical literature showed. And I also showed, so the the endocrinologist does not want the patient's symptoms to improve? No, he didn't qualify for symptom improvement. Well, they lost. They lost bad. And all because they, I was able to show based on the medical studies and the literature how the symptoms improve and how the health will improve. And it has nothing to do with numbers. And they wanted to restrict the therapy based on a number. What a shame. It shifts the tipping point in the decision to treat more towards the clinical assess assessment and symptomatology and signs rather than wildly varying and often invalid laboratory measures. I think I read this about 10 times in my testimony to explain that the endocrinologist is completely clueless and not anything based on the medical literature and science. If this basically safe form of treatment with key emphasis on the word safe 
produce a symptomatic improvement and an improved quality of life for years on end is a fully justified form of mainstream medical treatment for a very common and important and underdiagnosed and above all undertreated condition. And I was able to show and prove that the endocrinologists that are supposed to be the specialists at this fall way short of adequately treating this condition. And I showed how it improves health and wellness and it improves quality of life. And I was able to show that the endocrinologist was not concerned about improving quality of life because he didn't qualify. It was sort of an enjoyment for me to do because they had no response. It should be realized finally that normal hormone levels do not imply per se normal physiologic effects. The number one um, issue, not necessarily complaint, issue problem that I see on a daily basis from physicians is that, well, what do I do? The blood tests are now optimal, but the patient still has symptoms. What do I do? What do you think I'm going to say? What do you want me to say? Oh, just let them suffer? Well, you need, the level, you need to raise the levels. You need to give more. But the numbers are already high. My question is, why did you measure the levels? Did you not expect the levels to go up? Well, yeah, of course. Well, now that they've gone up, what would you expect? Well, I expect the patient to get better. Well, levels do not imply normal physiologic effects. They do not guarantee that all of the symptoms and signs will improve. We'll look at some of those studies later. The higher the level of the hormone, the better the response. And there is no plateau. There is no level that everything stops working. It will continue to work the higher the level, the higher the dose that you use until you get symptomatic improvement. Indeed, it's the interaction of the ligand with the hormone receptor, as well as the, as the presence of co-activators and co-inhibitors that determine the biological effect. So did you look at the co-inhibitor? Did you look at receptor site resistance and blockade? Well, no. Well, you can't. There's no test. There's an indirect way, and that is symptomatic improvement, as well as signs that improve cholesterol, body fat, aesthetics, etc. Because there's no generally accepted cutoff value of a plasma testosterone for defining androgen deficiency, let me say it again, there's no generally accepted cutoff except self-made by the, quote, experts that are trying to restrict. There's no cutoff value for defining androgen deficiency, and the absence of convincing evidence for an altered androgen requirement in elderly men, we consider that normal range of free testosterone in young males also to be valid for older men. If you're wanting to look at numbers and you want to play that game, you want to play the number game? I don't play the number game. But if you want to play the number game, then shoot for a free testosterone in the upper range of normal for young males. We discussed that in the courses as to how to know the difference between the reference ranges for younger males and older males. If you want to be normal, then don't take anything. If you want to have the signs and symptoms of getting older, then don't take anything. If you want to feel and function better, then your levels are going to have to be much higher and normal. As already mentioned, in the absence of a reliable, clinically useful biological parameter, i.e. a blood test, these criteria of hypogonadism of the aging men are somewhat arbitrary. It is self-made and self-restricted by the endocrine society and the FDA to try to restrict the use of it. We don't restrict the use of hormones in women, but yet we want to restrict the use of it in men. It really makes no sense. I'll show you what we used to do in comparison with what is now recommend, recommended by the FDA. The treatment aims at restoring hormone levels in the normal range of young adults, and more importantly, at alleviating the symptoms suggestive of the hormone deficiency is, is our goal. That's the aim. However, the ultimate goal are to maintain or regain the highest quality of life, to reduce disability, to compress major illness, cardiovascular disease, into a narrow range and add life to years. I was able to get the attorneys to ask this one endocrinologist, so you don't want your patient to have the highest quality of life because they didn't qualify based on a number. You didn't want to reduce disability, 
and you didn't want to reduce cardiovascular disease because they didn't qualify based on a number. Yet all the studies show and support that. They lost. This is another article from the urology literature. Limitations of current laboratory tests for testosterone efficiency have led to poor reliability that precludes the use of any test as a sole basis for diagnosis. But yet, based on the FDA wanting to restrict the use of testosterone, they've come up with these guidelines. Remember, the numbers are a poor, reliable test to use as a diagnosis. Performance characteristics and di diagnostic parameters of the test lack standardization. There's this one study that looked at different labs using the same machine, and these different labs had all different reference ranges with the same reagents. Combined with the inherent fluctuations in testosterone levels seen on a daily basis, the limitations mandate a diagnostic approach that relies on clinical signs and symptoms of hypogonadism as much as it does laboratory results. And just because you have a laboratory result that's not below 300 does not mean the clinical signs and symptoms will not improve. And this was published in another article in the Journal of Urology. Until such standardization is commonplace in clinical laboratories, the decision to treat should be based on the presence of signs and symptoms. In addition to testosterone measurement, I do not use the testosterone test to restrict therapy. I show the patient, yes, it's low. Then when I retest it, I show them that the patient improved based on the number. That's the only reason I use the number. I do not use it to restrict it, and I do not use it to deny increasing the dose that I use in order to help improve symptoms. Rigid interpretation of testosterone ranges should not dictate clinical decision making. Yet AACE wants to paint us in a corner that we have to use those numbers. The experts want to use those numbers. They criticize physicians for using testosterone, even high levels of it, or looking at numbers that are high, and completely ignore the fact that the patient gets better. The problematic state of testosterone assessment begins with a lack of consensus about the definition of low testosterone amongst endocrinologists, urologists, and clinical pathologists. Published ranges for normal are based on measurements in older men. It's an average of old, sick men. Oh, perfect. Your level's perfectly normal for someone that's old and sick. And not designed to establish ranges in men with normal sexual and reproductive function, i.e. young men. Variation in serum levels, aging, obesity, thyroid dysfunction, diabetes, estrogens, other drugs like statins and narcotics will adversely affect how testosterone improves symptoms and signs. One size does not fit all. Serum testosterone concentrations can vary by more than three orders of magnitude depending on age, health, and other factors. No test accurately captures this variation. But yet, we, want, we get painted into the corner of numbers, levels, which is really a shame, but the literature supports the opposite. So which sort of test is best? Radio immunoassay, immunoassays, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, employ different principles to assess testosterone levels, and they all have limitations. So which one is the best one? I remember Mark Gordon argued with me, which was the best test? My best test? The cheapest one. Yes, I use the cheapest one. It makes no difference which test to use. Some of them are $200. Why do you want to use it? Well, it's more accurate. More accurate for what? You treat based on symptomatology and signs and improvement of quality of life, not based on a number that is going to restrict your therapy. Well, what about monitoring levels? Once it say you're supposed to monitor levels, which test do you do to monitor level? The cheap one. And when do you test it? It's not in the guideline as to when you test it. We'll look at when to test at the end of this talk. At this point, there's no specific assay that can be recommended as superior. I use the cheapest one. It makes the most sense because the numbers are a guide why spend so much money on an expensive test when it's really meaningless? 
The review led to a position statement that reflects the author's findings and concerns about the current state of laboratory assessment of serum testosterone. The statement comprises two basic principles. Give equivalent weight to signs and symptoms, and not just laboratory values. You can use the number to confirm, but not restrict. No patient should be denied coverage of testosterone testing given the limitations of the current test. And of course, the insurance companies want to jump on board and say, we're not going to authorize payment for this because they don't qualify. Yes, but what about their symptoms? They don't qualify. You don't want to improve symptoms or signs or help them lose weight? No, they don't qualify based on this number that's designed to restrict. Again, this article says we shouldn't be doing that. Another article, different verbiage. Problems in the measurement of androgens and in interpreting the results have been reviewed and classified as follows. The exact sampling conditions in relation to circadian and seasonal variations, diet, alcohol, physical activity, and posture, need to be taken into consideration when we look at numbers. And we don't. Physiological medical factors. Androgen levels vary according to the patient's general health. Sample preservation and storage variables are often unknown. There's different androgen assays, there's different reagents, there's different tests, and they fluctuate, and they're subject to large inter-laboratory variation. We completely ignore that. Reference ranges vary widely, largely independent of methodology. I don't care if it's mass spec, I don't care if it's radio or immunoassay. They fail to take into account the log normal distribution of the androgen values causing errors in clinical diagnosis and treatment. Use it as a guide, don't use it as a restrictive number. That's what AACE wants us to do and so does the FDA. Other unknowns are antagonists, sex hormone binding globulin, estrogen, catecholamines, cortisol, antiandrogens, as well as age, receptor site polymorphisms, all play a major role in symptomatic improvement and the resistance to their action. Conclusion, the laboratory assays can support a diagnosis of deficiency, they should be not used to exclude it. It is suggested that there needs, that there needs to be a greater reliance on history and clinical features, symptomatology, and signs, together with careful evaluation of symptomatology. So in court, I was asked, would I treat a man with normal testosterone levels? And I said, absolutely, particularly this man that unfortunately suffered a myocardial infarction and trying to blame the testosterone on causing it. But the patient was able to lose 60 pounds on testosterone. Why would I use it if the levels were, quote, not less than 300 and were normal? And I presented 30 studies showing that there's significant and dramatic weight loss when testosterone is used. And none of those doctors, the cardiologists, no other doctor addressed the weight issues. And they were not successful in causing weight loss. The only one that was successful was the one that was able to give the patient testosterone. Androgen, androgen deficiency has been implicated as an important contributory factor in coronary heart disease, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, sexual desire disorders in men and women, and mental and physical aging in both sexes. Yeah, you get fat, you get old, you lose muscle, you lose energy. You lose aesthetics. It is of increasing clinical importance, therefore, to assess the validity of the androgen assays and their interpretation. Yet AACE wants to say, no, they don't qualify. And yet all the studies show they benefit when you use it. Though unfortunately, testosterone total is the most commonly measured and quoted. It is a poor indicator of clinical androgen activity. It doesn't fall that much with age. It's the free testosterone that really falls and has the weakest relationship to clinical states. And there's no accepted testosterone value that's a cutoff to define a deficiency. Those are self-made restrictions by the FDA and by AACE, but not based on science or literature. Symptoms, clinical impression, signs, and testosterone levels can aid in the diagnosis of hypogonadism. It has been found that calculated free testosterone 
or measured free testosterone shows a much higher correlation than any of the other measures. There you go, David. Um, as we get older, the total can still remain high because of sexual hormone binding globulin, but the free testosterone will fall because it's, the binding is increased. Well, though, then what do you do? Well, you want to lower sexual hormone binding globulin, right? And that way it'll free up the free testosterone. No, David, you're correct. All the studies show, as part three, the higher your level of se uh, sexual hormone binding globulin, the better protection against cardiovascular disease, cancer, and all-cause mortality. I don't want to lower the sex hormone binding globulin. In every study, the higher the better, the lower the worse. Yeah, but it binds onto the free testosterone. Well, then give more testosterone to raise the free. Yeah, but your total then is too high. So what? But that number bothers us. Get over it. If it bothers you, don't test it. If it bothers you, retest it. Don't take the, the testosterone when you test it. Then the number will be low and it won't bother you so much. Did you change the therapy? No. What you do? You change the time in which you tested it. Well, what do the guidelines say as to when you should test it? They don't say anything. There's no guideline as to when you should test it. So there's so many confounding variables in obtaining, preserving, and analyzing androgen samples that conventional interpretation in relation to arbitrary reference ranges seems inappropriate. It is suggested that in men, laboratory assays can support but not always exclude a diagnosis of androgen deficiency. It's signs and symptoms that indicate a therapeutic trial with testosterone should be given in patients without any contraindications. To sort of counter that is a nice article by Abe Morgenthaler. Testosterone therapy has become highly controversial. No kidding. It's not controversial to me, but it's controversial because there are certain groups, I will call them zealots, pundits, that want to restrict the use of it. Why? It just bothers them. Why not have every man on it if it's beneficial? It's interesting the amount of opinions from these, quote, experts that I read that want to restrict the use of it. The men don't need it. Studies show it doesn't work. There's important health consequences of testosterone deficiency and meaningful benefits with treatment. Thank you, Abe. Well stated. There's level one evidence that testosterone therapy improves sexual function and desire, body composition, aesthetics, and bone density. Concerns regarding testosterone causing cardiovascular risk were based on two flawed studies, and there's contradicted by dozens of other studies that show benefits improvement of outcomes with higher testosterone levels. Randomized placebo-controlled trials in men with known heart disease have shown to improve symptomatology and decrease events. Testosterone is neither scourge nor panacea. It's just simply good medicine. Thanks, Abe. The frequently stated assertion that the benefits of testosterone are unproven is simply false. There's level one evidence that testosterone improves all of our sexual function, muscle, ligaments, joints, tendons, bones, lipids, fat reduction, improved glycemic control. If we could come up with some drug that did all that, wouldn't it be great? The cardiovascular world would come alive, but yet I still see cardiologists have a fit when I prescribe testosterone to these patients, and the patients then tell the doctor that, that the reason for the weight loss and their symptomatic improvement and their lipid improvement is because they're on testosterone, and the doctors have a fit. They should embrace it, but they don't. So AACE and the FDA has done a very, very good job of brainwashing physicians into thinking that you shouldn't use it. It improves libido and sexual function, improves erectile function. Somehow or another, they're against that. Really? Today it's becoming increasingly clear that symptoms and clinical presentation should once again trump, oh, shouldn't have used that word, should once again take priority with blood test results and important yet secondary confirmation. You can use it to diagnose it, but don't use it to restrict. This means that healthcare providers must decide on whether a course of testosterone is indicated based on the totality of the clinical presentation, sign and symptoms, rather than on a simple blood test that is meant to be restricted by the FDA and AACE. 
The current widespread practice by health insurance companies like Medicare and others to restrict coverage based on a specific blood test threshold value lacks a scientific basis and is contrary to good medical practice. I love reading this in court. The diagnosis of testosterone deficiency requires clinical judgment. That's why we're physicians, we make clinical judgment and attempts to replace this with an irrational adherence to arbitrary selected values that are restrictive prevents healthcare providers from offering important treatments to appropriately selected patients. Let me go back and restate this in a different way. In addition, for all of you that are out there that test levels and you see the levels high and that level bothers you and you don't know what to do because the level's high and you want to restrict it, you want to restrict increasing the dose based on that number, I think is inappropriate. Men are not defined by the testosterone values. The clinical presentation is most important. Symptomatic improvement is most important. And yet you're afraid of those numbers. If you're afraid of what's on the other side of the door, don't open the door. If you're afraid of the number, then don't test the level. Treat symptomatology. The denial of health healthcare coverage by insurance companies based on requirements to meet specific testosterone thresholds is unscientific and replaces clinical judgment and what we do as doctors with an arbitrary threshold for an imprecise test representing a transparent desire on the part of the insurance companies to deny treatment and reduce costs. But the patient then suffers. This practice should be condemned. Testosterone therapy is simply good medicine. Thanks, Abe. We found no compelling scientific evidence to support the recent allegations of increased cardiovascular risk, risk with testosterone therapy. That's another complaint from the experts that it causes heart attacks. On the contrary, there's rich literature dating back to more than 70 years strongly suggesting that testosterone therapy has many cardiovascular benefits. There's no risk. What this means in the meantime is a primary care practitioner should not be discouraged from treating men with testosterone deficiency, also termed hypogonadism, if they feel it's clinically indicated. Treatment clearly provides important benefits for improval of signs and symptoms and sexual dysfunction, libido and fatigue. Doctor, I've got fatigue. Well, that's too bad. You don't qualify for treatment. Really? You really say that? You really think that? Well, they didn't qualify based on numbers. And you're a doctor. Yep. Makes no sense whatsoever. Testosterone administration significantly improved 10 to 12 measures of sexual activity. This is from JCEM. Incremental increases in testosterone, total and free, were associated with improvements in sexual activity and desire, and there's no threshold level that was observed for any outcome. Improvement of sexual desire and activity in response to testosterone therapy was related to the magnitude of increase in testosterone and, of course, estradiol level. That's a lecture in itself. And there's no clear evidence of any threshold effect. Yeah, but the level's already 1,000. I can't go up. Why? Well, because of the number, and you don't want to treat the patient. You don't want them to improve. Well, yeah, I do, but the number. There's an improvement in symptomatology with higher testosterone levels. Don't restrict it. Don't stop giving it based on your fear of a number. I'll bring this up again. The magnitude of an improvement is due to the testosterone level and the estradiol level. I noticed that there's a lecture coming up at the next anti-aging meeting that discusses the importance of blocking estrogen in men. Well, I think you've all had a lecture on that already, but I will further emphasize there's some more recent studies showing the harm when you block it. There's no evidence anywhere in the literature that shows benefit, and there's no clear evidence of a threshold effect. The more that you give, the more that you will see improvement in symptomatology. Don't restrict it. Normalization of testosterone is associated with reduced incidence of myocardial infarction. In this large observational cohort with extended follow-up, normalization, that's vague, optimizing, 
testosterone levels after testosterone therapy was associated with a significant reduction in all-cause mortality, MI, and stroke. And you restricted it. You don't want to give it because you don't want to decrease mortality, MI, or stroke. No, they don't qualify for it based on their number. Really? Professional guidelines recommend testosterone replacement therapy. In patients with signs and symptoms of hypogonadism, the professional guidelines from the Urology Association recommends treatment for symptoms. AACE recommends treatment for numbers and not symptoms, and they ignore the patient based on their guidelines, which are designed to be restrictive. However, can you prescribe outside of the guidelines? Yes. If you go to the PDR and you open the PDR, it states, once a medicine is FDA approved for any indication, it can be used for any other indication. It does not re require FDA approval for use for some other symptom or indication if there's medical studies to show benefit. Let's look at that. This is from the AMA Journal of Ethics. I have asked experts, can you give testosterone off-label? No, you have to go by the guidelines. Really? That's against AMA ethics. Any medicine can be prescribed off-label. Let's see what that means. Approval by the FDA implies that Available evidence shows that a drug is safe and effective for the specific indication, disease, or symptom for which it was tested. So what the FDA's role is, is, is in assuring safety and efficacy based on studies. That's it. The FDA should not regulate the practice of medicine, only approval of medication. Off-label drug use commonly refers to prescribing currently available medication, like testosterone, for an indication of disease or symptom for which it has not received FDA approval. We'll look at the study of what the FDA approval used to be for. It was for treatment of symptoms of andropause. There was no number. There was no biological parameter. However, because of the desire of the FDA to restrict the use because of over-advertisement by the drug pharmaceutical industry for testosterone beyond its FDA approval, the FDA stepped in and said, okay, we're going to spank you and we're going to make testosterone only FDA approved for levels less than 300, and that's total testosterone. So based on the most recent FDA change in their approval process, testosterone is only indicated for FDA approval if the testosterone total is less than 300 on two separate occasions measured only in the morning when it's the highest. Why don't you measure it in the afternoon? Well, because that's when it would be the lowest and everyone would qualify. So we're going to restrict those people by testing in the morning when the level is the highest so that we can restrict most people from qualifying for it. Well, the FDA should not dictate to physicians when and when they cannot use testosterone, and they don't. But what they did was they changed the guidelines for FDA approval in that you have to have levels less than 300 based on FDA approval for testosterone. That does not mean that you cannot use it off-label, which means for levels greater than 300. So you're using it off-label. I emphasize in the courses that when you prescribe testosterone, you document and tell the patient that you're using it for off-label use. I see attorneys ask this all the time. Doctor, did you tell the patient that you're using it for off-label use? Well, you can use any medicine for, for off-label use, and we typically don't tell patients that we're using it for off-label use because it's perfectly legal to do so. Off-label use also includes prescribing a drug for a different population or an age range or a level other than that which was clinically tested and approved. We can use it for a different dosage or a different dosage form. Once a drug is FDA approved for a specific indication, 
Legally, it can be used for any other indication for a level greater than 300, other than for which it was FDA approved. Off-label prescribing is common. It accounts for 10 to 20% of all prescriptions written. The FDA does not prohibit physicians from writing prescriptions for off-label use. The FDA cannot and does not prohibit physicians from writing testosterone for off-label use. And Congress has repeatedly taken legal steps to prevent the FDA from interfering with the practice of medicine. Unfortunately, now the AACE has stepped up with the guidelines, and they say in their guidelines, testosterone is FDA approved if you have two levels less than 300. Well, I've had attorneys say that the FDA says you cannot use it. No. Where does it say you cannot use it? It says right here. No, that doesn't say it cannot be used. It says it is FDA approved for use in levels less than 300. It does not have the verbiage you cannot use it. That is completely entirely wrong. You can use it, and you can use it for off-label use, and it's legal to do so. Off-label use is appropriate when it is in the best interest of the patient. Really? Based on signs and symptoms and improving quality of life and health, yes. On the basis of credible public scientific data supporting the use of it. Conclusion. Off-label prescribing is a common and legal practice in medicine. This practice is justified when scientific evidence suggests that efficacy and safety of a medication for an indication for which it does not have an FDA approval and when the practice is supported by expert consensus and practice guidelines. Yes, you can use it for off-label use. It says it right here in the AMA Journal of Ethics. This is an interesting article that was on the use of clomiphene, but everyone aware of was the FDA has made recent attempts to restrict the use of testosterone products to curb overuse in men who simply have low testosterone due to aging. The FDA has issued a drug safety communication reiterated that such products are approved for replacement therapy only for men who have low levels of testosterone, less than 300, due to a disorder of the testicles and the brain like a tumor. That group accounts for less than 5% of those currently being treated. Really? Yes, 95% are therefore being treated off-label. Is that illegal? No. And in this paper, our intended population is overweight and obese men that do not fall into that level of less than 300 guideline. Yes, you can use it. It's perfectly legal to do so. And the AMA says, yes, it is legal to use it off-label. So do I go by those guidelines? No. Do I go by what the FDA approves it for? No. That's if you want to get insurance approval. I don't use insurance, and I don't, as Morgan Taller says, those are not evidence-based medicine guidelines. So I use it off-label, but I don't bill insurance for it. And I strongly suggest that you don't. So, let's look at numbers. This is not drawn to scale, but it's drawn just to explain levels. In blue is a blood level of testosterone that is administered IM. The half-life typically is around six to seven days, and after about seven days, your level will fall back down to a level of around 200. If your baseline level is 200 and you get a shot, your level can go up to 25, 2600. But after a period of seven days, your level can fall back down here to 200 after seven days. So if you're treating man or a man with an IM injection, when do you measure the levels? Well, you don't want to measure it here. If you measure it here, it's too high and some endocrinologist is going to criticize you because the level is too high. If you measure it down here, you'll say, well, the level is too low, and the patient says, yeah, well, how come my levels are so low? So when do you test it? 
Well, you want to test it around day four or five when your level's right here. Why? Well, because that gives you the level that's not too high and upset anyone, and the level's not too low that upsets a patient. It gives you a level in the middle of the range that pleases the most people. Did you change the therapy? No. What you did is you changed the time in which you test it. You manipulated the day on which you test it to give you the number that pleases you the most. That's nebulous. It's, it's ludicrous to do that, to test the level. But you have to have a level. You've got to go to the number of this. Okay, if you're going to test, then test out here. Test when the level is low, and therefore your level is always going to be low, which shows that, yes, the, the patient's levels are low, and it's okay to use. On the other hand, if you use a transdermal cream, your level can be 2,000 every day, which is my preference of choice. So let's look at what happens at seven days. Do you want your level to be 200 or do you want your level to be 2,000? I prefer my level to be 2,000 rather than 200. That's somewhat of the downside of using this. But people say, well, when they use the testosterone gel or cream, it didn't do much. Well, that's because the level that you maintained was down here. If you maintain levels that are down here, you will not see symptom improvement. Yeah, but the level's 1,000 and they still don't feel better. Well, yeah, I know. It's because the level typically has to be around 1,500 to 2,000 before you're going to see any symptomatic improvement. Yeah, but then the number's too high. How do you know it's high? Because we measured it. All right, well then, wait a day, don't test it, don't take it, and your level's going to be back down to 200 again. And it'll give you a number that doesn't upset you. So which test do you use? Radio, you know, assay, ELISA, liquid chromatography, mass spec, it makes no difference. When do you test it? It makes no difference. Therefore, if you're going to test it, use the cheapest one. If you want the number to be low to show that they're still low and that it tests also is indicated, well then test it out here and give you a low level so that you can rationalize the use of it. Don't test up here. The number is going to be too high and somebody's going to be upset. Did you change the therapy? No. So this is why I put my levels right here. Patients come to me and see me because I optimize their levels. When do I test? I don't. Why? Because I'm treating signs and symptoms. You can test to show that the patient's levels are good and that they improve, but sometimes they get upset when the level's up here. You will not see weight loss until your level is up here. You will not see weight loss and improvement in your lipids until your level is up here. You keep the levels down here, you will not see weight loss. That's why those studies show it didn't work. When you keep the levels down around 600, which is what they did in the study from JAMA, you're not going to see much improvement in symptoms or weight loss or lipids. That's because your level is too low. Let's look at pellets. Typically, for those of you that use pellets, you wait three months or four months, and then you put in another pellet. Or you wait until the patient becomes symptomatic. Why is the patient symptomatic? Because the level is 200. So pellets don't maintain levels out here and then suddenly drop. If you measured pellets like I have, you'll see each week the level will continue to fall each week until you get to a level down around 200. You'll become extremely symptomatic, and then you'll put in a pellet, and the level will go back up, and then the patient will feel fine, and then they will fall. If you use a transdermal preparation and keep the levels around 1,500 to 2,000 every day, at three months, your level is 1,500 to 2,000 versus down around 200. Which would you level... Which where would you like your level to be? 200, 2,000. Symptomatic, not symptomatic. That's why I do what I do. What lab test do I use? It doesn't matter. When do you test it? You test it whenever you want to, to give you a number that's not too low, that's not too high, it's in the middle that pleases everyone. Get my point? It makes no difference what lab test you use, it makes no difference when you test it. You can test it wherever you want. I treat based on symptomatic improvement, weight loss, lipids improvement, sexual function improvement. There is no threshold value. You will still continue to get improvement in symptomatology. There's no threshold value when you increase the dose. But you're afraid of the dose because the level is high. Don't test the level. Anyway, that's what I do. I hope this was helpful to help you overcome your concern about FDA guidelines. I hope that 
excuse me, FDA indications and AACE guidelines. The FDA cannot make guidelines. Only medical societies can make guidelines. The confusion about levels, when to test, which test to do. And our goal should be on symptomatic improvement based on the literature that I showed you and based on the studies that I showed you, as opposed to playing their game and looking at numbers and restricting therapy based on numbers and lowering doses that I see doctors do all the time because the number's too high, so they lower the dose. Why don't you just change the day in which you test it and keep the dose the same because the patients improve? You're restricting health and wellness and symptomatology improvement based on your fear of the number. Anyway, hope that was fun. Questions? Now, can I interrupt for just a minute? For you those can. of you that just joined us, in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, you should see the question and answer box where you can enter your questions to Neil. Back to you, Neil. Question. What if testosterone dose is super high, along with increasing estradiol levels to 10 times normal? How did you know that the estradiol level was 10 times normal? Well, because you tested it. Why did you test it? Well, because that's what we were taught. I didn't teach you that. Why are you worried about the estradiol level? How long have we been using testosterone? That's a two-hour lecture. Sorry, I can't give you the lecture, Denora. Um, we've been using testosterone for 50 or 60 years. There's 6,000 studies on using testosterone. And in every case, when we use it, we raise estradiol levels. What study showed harm? None? Okay. If you look at all the studies where we use aromatase inhibitors to lower estradiol level, it causes harm. Increase in body fat, increase in subcutaneous fat, increase in cholesterol, lowering HDL, all lipid parameters are reversed when you block estrogen. So Dove Rand recently um, asked me, he said, what do I do about my high estradiol level? And I said, why'd you test it? And he said, well, I don't know. And I said, well, don't test it. Did they test estradiol levels in any of these studies when they showed cardiovascular protection? No. Then why are you testing it? Well, because you have something called confirmational bias. Confirmational bias was you heard it and read it somewhere. I just want you to show me a study where it's harmful. Now, of course, everyone's going to jump up and down and say, well, there was this, you know, studies that show that high estradiol levels in men baseline are associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. I don't disagree with that. But that's a baseline observation study, and observation does not prove causation. What I asked you to do is to show me a study when you raise it, it's harmful. I didn't ask you to show me a baseline study. I asked you to show me a study that it's harmful when you raise it. You can't. There aren't any. Are there any studies? You haven't taken part three or four. If you don't know about it, you don't realize that we treat men with prostate cancer with estradiol. Any harm? No. So what study shows harm when we give estradiol? Which study shows harm when we raise estradiol by giving testosterone? None. Yeah, but high baseline, that's a baseline observation. You have to show me that it's harmful when you give it and you raise it. I can't find any studies. There's now about 20 studies to show harm when you lower it. So if the estradiol level goes up, perfect. That's what I want it to do. That's where we see the benefit. Do I prescribe an astrozole aromatase inhibitors ever? Um, when I want, you know me by now, when I want to lose bone, when I want to raise subcutaneous and visceral fat, when I want to cause erectile dysfunction, then I will use aromatase inhibitors. You can use them for nipple sensitivity. I use it for a month or two and I stop it. If not, is it, is it even, I don't understand this, does it worsen ED in spite of high testosterone levels? Yeah, if you use a, an astrozole, in every study, it lowers erectile function and lowers libido. So I don't want to lower libido or erectile function. I don't want to increase fat. I don't want to increase bone loss. I don't want to cause dyslipidemia. So I don't use it. You can if you want to. When you want to cause those things, then use aromatase inhibitors. Could I 
talk about six hormone binding globulin, how to decrease it if it's high. Well, Solomon, you obviously haven't taken part three. If you take part three, you'll get an hour-long lecture on the benefit of high sex hormone binding globulin and the harm of low. Why do you want to lower it? Well, because it binds onto the free testosterone. Yes, but when you lower it, then you increase your risk of cancer, all-cause mortality, and heart disease. Why do you want to do that? Well, because it binds onto the free testosterone. Why don't you give more testosterone? The solution to high sex hormone binding globulin is simply to give more testosterone. So how then could you lower sex hormone binding globulin? You could lower sex hormone binding globulin by, well, what disease entity do you see low sex hormone binding globulin? Diabetes, PCOS. In women that have PCOS, their sex hormone binding globulin levels are very low because their insulin levels are high. So to way, the way to lower sex hormone binding globulin, eat carbs, become diabetic, or take insulin. All three of those things will be very successful in lowering sex hormone binding globulin. Again, Solomon, take part three. You'll see all the studies showing benefit. I did show some of those in part one and part two. But in part three, it's just thoroughly amazing the literature that shows that sex hormone binding globulin is actually a very vasoactive and metabolically active protein. Androgen receptor resistance. Use of cobalt. You know, well, you can use anything you want to try to change receptor site resistance. The way I treat receptor site resistance is I give more testosterone. It's a real simple, easy solution. Robert asked, what about the possible increased conversion to DHT? Yeah, testosterone does increase the DHT. I, I guess I should go back to this slide here. Um, the 5-alpha reductase enzyme that converts testosterone into dihydrotestosterone um, is found primarily in the skin. And if you use IM or pellet therapy, your DHT levels are not that high. The highest DHT level will be if you apply it on the scrotal area or genital area like the labia. And it'll get testosterone levels up and, and the DHT levels up quite high. Many men that I see that are on pellets or that are on testosterone shots and still claim sexual dysfunction or, or not a, an adequate libido or sexual response, I will give them the transdermal, which will raise their DHT level from 100 to 1,000, and then those symptoms will improve. So does it increase conversion into DHT? Yes, it does. Um, there's no harm in increasing DHT. If you remember, I discussed the saturation model in part one and the saturation model in part three and four on how raising testosterone levels does not cause increase in prostate cancer cell growth because it's already maximally saturated. The same thing applies to the hair follicle, that once the hair follicle is maximally saturated, that taking testosterone or taking more of it does not increase hair loss any more than baseline, which is why we don't see any increase in hair loss in any of the studies in men that use testosterone because of the saturation effect. So do you convert more DHT and estradiol with high testosterone levels? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what I want. Should LH be used as a marker for adequate testosterone? Um, no, not really. What should be used as a marker would be the free testosterone if you want to use it. But again, when should you test it? It doesn't say. I use signs and symptoms. When I start to see body weight fall, visceral fat fall, cholesterol levels fall, and that's your dose. Um, Donora asked, may the worsened ED be due to super high estradiol? No. If you go to the studies and you look at estradiol levels and you go to the New England Journal of Medicine study and the recent study that was published in JCEM, you will see that estradiol is actually responsible for the sexual function. It wasn't the testosterone. When they blocked the estradiol, it resulted in ED and lower libido. When they still blocked conversion, but then gave estradiol, sexual symptoms improved. What if it improves with an astrozole? Then go ahead and use it. That's fine. But when you do use it, then you cause dyslipidemia, bone loss, increase in visceral fat, subcutaneous fat. Why would you do that? 
Well, because you want to lower it. Yeah, but what about the heart disease, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, visceral fat, subcutaneous fat, when you use an astrazole? What do you do about that? Now you see what's on the other side of the coin. Everyone wants to lower it because of your confirmational bias because you heard or read that you have to lower it. Go ahead and lower it. That's okay. How do you decrease estradiol if it increases drastically along with increasing testosterone levels? How did you know that it goes up? You tested it. Why did you test it? I don't know why you tested it. Cheryl asked, what is the name of the article addressing reason to not block huge estradiol levels in men? Um, well, there's, there's, there's 20 articles on it. There's not just one, but the, the, the one that I referred to was the 2013 New England Journal of Medicine article. Desmond asked, uh, will a list of the supporting studies be available after the webinar? Um, yes. Um, you can contact Dana or Mary, and they will give you a list of the studies. Jeff asked, um, what about the DHT conversion in high-dose transdermal creams? Um, I'm not sure what your question is. Oh, what about the high conversion? Well, that's why I use the transdermal cream, is so I high conversion. Terry asked, so what dose of transdermal testosterone do you use to maintain um, 1,500 to 2,000 serum levels? It depends on the individual. Um, how much insulin do you use to maintain adequate blood sugar? Well, it, it depends on the person. Um, how much do I use? Well, it, it depends on the person. Uh, it depends on their body mass index. Um, how well they metabolize it, et cetera. So it, it just de thoroughly depends on the dose. Uh, I, I mean, depends on the person and the response. Sandy asks, um, what level is too high in elderly for estradiol levels uh, since that will increase with testosterone treatment? Um, I, I'm not quite sure what your question is. How high is too high? Um, there's no level that's too high. Um, show me which one of the 6,000 studies in the last 60 years um, showed that testosterone, the estradiol level was too high and that it caused harm. You're all stuck on estradiol. I do not measure estradiol levels. If you measure estradiol level and ask me what to do with it, I will tell you, do whatever you want with it. Yeah, but it's high. Why did you test it? Well, because we're taught and told. I didn't teach you that. What study shows that you need to measure estradiol levels in the medical literature? Please forward those studies. Martin says, great stuff as always. Thank you. Desmond asked, um, what about conversion to DHT with transdermal? Yes, it does convert to DHT. Absolutely. William says, you don't mention elevated hemoglobin. Uh, that we often see with testosterone replacement therapy. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, you'll get a, a two-hour lecture in Beyond Hormones on um, elevated hemoglobin. There's going to be a nice lecture. I say that's tongue-in-cheek. Uh, there's a lecture at upcoming AMMG on the need to use phlebotomy to lower um, hemoglobin when you use testosterone. Yes, you can use it. That's fine. Um, there's 500 million people around the world that live above 7,500 feet, and they all have erythrocytosis or high hemoglobin levels. What treatment do you use on those people? There's several million people in the U.S. that have COPD and emphysema and have hemoglobin levels of 20 to 21. What treatment do you use in those people to lower hemoglobin? Um, I use the same treatment to lower hemoglobin that you get with erythrocytosis from testosterone use. I use the same treatment that I use in people that live at high altitude and the same treatment that I use in patients with COPD. Um, I'll show you all of those articles and studies to show that erythrocytosis in, in use of testosterone in all these articles in the literature is not harmful in men. You are confusing erythrocytosis with polycythemia. Yes, the polycythemia is the high red blood cells that cause the harm. I'll show you it's not the red blood cells, it's the platelets. What are your thoughts on treating older guys? Chris, what's your definition of an older guy? 
uh, I turn old next month. Anyway, on older guys who have existing cardiovascular disease, um, there's a multitude of studies showing that in men that have significant atherosclerotic disease, have MIs or surgery or have a diagnosis of ASVD, um, those men that are treated with testosterone all get better, decrease in events, decrease in plaque, decrease in insulin media thickness. Now, don't quote the PILO study and don't quote the JAMA study where it did nothing. I understand that. That's because the doses that they use of androgel didn't work. If you look at all the other studies where they used high doses of testosterone, there was significant improvement in outcomes, reduction in all the cardiovascular risk factors, reduction in visceral fat, reduction in weight, reduction in inflammatory cytokines when you use enough of it. So in spite of the fact that you're still worried about this confirmational bias because of those two flawed studies, there's a ton of studies and literature showing protection and lack of harm and reversal of cardiovascular disease and events. Janice, uh, how does this principle of treat the patient, not the number, uh, in relationship to female testosterone levels? Well, I guess you're going to have to wait for the next webinar to figure that out. Um, the same thing applies. Um, I treat symptoms, not numbers. There's plenty of studies out there. And, and of course, in part one, I showed you a half a dozen studies showing that superphysiologic levels of testosterone um, are needed in order to result in symptomatic improvement. A recent study looked at um, serum levels of testosterone, levels of 100 total were not beneficial in improving symptomatology in women, levels of 300 was. A recent study looked at injectable testosterone. Um, doses of 5, 10, 15 milligrams per week did not result in symptomatic improvement, but 25 milligrams did result in symptomatic improvement. Uh, the levels that uh, were achieved were 200 total testosterone or greater. So yeah, the, the same feature applies. Everyone's hung up on numbers, and when the numbers look at ranges for old sick people, that's a range of normal it doesn't mean where they get the most improvement, where they're going to see the metabolic changes, where they're going to get the maximum symptomatic improvement. It's just a range of a number for an average of all people that were tested. That's all it is. It doesn't show where they derive the most benefits. Mark asked, um, would I agree that stroke and MI are the major complications that testosterone administering docs get sued for? Um, Probably 50%, yes. 50% um, was uh, MI. 50% um, were, um, of the 50%, 25% were uh, MI, 25% were DVTs or blood clots. Um, so far, we've won all those cases. Um, but yes, it is. So um, document in your note that the, FD, the PDR says that it can cause clots. Did you tell the patient you device them? Yes, I did. It says it right here in my note. Well, why did you give it if it causes it? Well, because all the literature shows that it doesn't, but even though it says it in the PDR. I know it's one of those um, ironies of medicine. Um, the first case that went to trial for AbbVie, um, they won, and it showed that testosterone was not the cause of the MI in the first patient that sued. Now they've got 5,000 more to go through. Christine asked, a PMDs stop our testosterone treatment when patients' blood pressure suddenly goes up? Um, I can show you a dozen articles where testosterone results in lower blood pressure. Um, if it does go up, um, then I don't know. There's something else going on. Um, I typically don't see it go up, but it's certainly possible. Um, I'm an ER doc. You should see the number of people that come into the ER with high blood pressure that say, well, normally my blood pressure was not up. But when they're in the ER and they're stressed, the blood pressure goes up. Um, it's called white coat hypertension. So if they go to the doctor and they get white coat hypertension, um, the blood pressure goes up, the PMD tells them to stop the testosterone. Then I give the patient all the studies showing that testosterone does not increase the blood pressure and actually it goes down. And there's a multitude of studies to show that it does not go up, that it goes down. Um, the response to the PMD, if they care to listen, um, you can tell them and talk to them. But unfortunately, doctors don't listen. 
um, they have a pre this confirmational bias against the use of testosterone, and anything that's bad that happens, they blame on the testosterone. I would simply give them those studies to show that no, testosterone does not cause it to go up. In most circumstances, it causes it to go down. And yes, come get all the water you want from Houston. Um, please send it. <laughs> I hope you guys have recovered. I know it's it's terrible. I'm sorry. I hope everyone recovers from all of this. Uh, Martin asked, weight training, weight loss, um, precursors. Um, I'm I'm not sure what your question is, Martin. Um, weight training will cause muscle gain. Um, exercise aerobic will cause weight loss due to fat loss. Um, does DHEA help? No. DHEA can help with visceral fat. We see that in all the studies. Um, but if you measure levels in men, like I have, um, DHEA can increase testosterone slightly in women. It does not increase it in men. It's just not strong or potent enough to. Um, Steve May says, please address relationship of sex hormone binding globulin uh, total and free testosterone. Well, sex hormone binding globulin binds onto the free testosterone and lowers it. So in order to get the free testosterone level up, which is our test of choice to monitor therapy, um, in order to get the free up, then it's going to double the total testosterone. And then everyone gets upset with the total. No, it's okay. Just look and monitor the free testosterone and not the total. And it goes up. Don't test it. Steve says, um, Medically, legally, uh, the guidelines don't even recommend doing screening PSA. Um, obviously, we'll do with hormone replacement. Um, yeah, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force says don't test it anymore. They sort of reneged and came back to, to midstream and said, well, yeah, you can. I do because I want to be able to diagnose the cancer and treat it. Um, and again, in part four, I go over the, the treatment. We'll go over that and beyond hormones too, where Dr. Pang will um, address um, the treatment of prostate cancer with relatively much safer methods as opposed to what's currently being used. Um, yes, I do measure a PSA and I do follow PSA yearly and we go over what happens when the PSA goes up and how to test for it and, and what to look for and how to get the PSA down. Um, they don't recommend measuring PSA anymore because elevation of PSA is typically more commonly due to prostatitis, prostatosis. So use an antibiotic for 10 days and then retest it. You'll commonly see that it goes down. Um, are you still recommending digital rectal exam in your office um, or defer to the PCP uh, to medically legal cover you for the PSA? Um, no, I don't think there's any medical legal reason to do a digital rectal exam because you're not going to pick, pick up a prostate cancer unless somebody's got, you know, severe disease that you can feel. And if they got severe disease that you can feel, their PSA is going to be markedly elevated. Um, I do a digital rectal exam on everyone, not for the PSA, um, but I do it or still a call. I wish I had a dollar for every time I picked up a colon cancer, which is the most common cancer between both sexes. So, you know, I've picked up probably in, in 30 years over 100 colon cancers that were not diagnosed by anyone else, and I did it because I did the exam and I saw the blood um, on the hemocold. So I don't defer to the, to the PCP. I don't think you really need to do it. Uh, the standard guidelines are don't do pap smears anymore. If they don't come in for a pap smear, then you can't do a pelvic to look for ovarian cancer, and you can't do a rectal to look for colon cancer. So I don't think there's a medical legal issue on doing PSAs or doing um, prostate exams, but I just think it's good standard of practice. William says, I have several patients that ask me about raised hemoglobin levels. Yes, um, I understand the difference between erythrocytosis and polycythemia, but how do you explain that to the patient? In part one, I gave you the letter to give to the patient that explains it. Don't give it to the doctor. The doctor will not explain it. Um, if it's an issue with the doctor, then you have to go phlebotomize. The doctors are not going to understand anything that you say or show. Um, and beyond hormones, I will, I'm going to give that erythrocytosis uh, PCD lecture. Um, I'm also going to give a lecture on blood clots, both DVTs and MIs, and show all the literature that supports, no, it's not harmful, and erythrocytosis does not increase the risk in any of those studies. But people will extrapolate the harm of polycythemia 
with the thrombocytosis and the increase in platelet count and the platelet stickiness of polycythemia, they'll extrapolate that to erythrocytosis from taking testosterone, and we shouldn't because no study shows harm of it, and no study shows that 500 million people that live at altitude that have physiologic erythrocytosis have any increase in blood clots, MIs, or heart attacks. However, don't teach a pig to sing and don't try to explain that to the PMD. They don't understand, they don't grasp it. But I do give that letter to patients to explain to them that it is not an issue. However, if it's an issue, you gotta go get phlebotomized because the doctor's not gonna know or understand. I recently had knee replacement. My hemoglobin was 19 and a half. Oh boy, here we go. So the surgeon said, you got polycythemia. I said, no, I don't. They go, yeah, you do. And I go, oh boy, okay. I said, I think it's lab air. I said, it's not lab air. I said, yes, it is. Let's retest it. Give me a lab slip and I'll go to the lab and I'll have it retested. He said, okay, sure. I made a beeline to my office, took a liter bag of saline, emptied it out on the flowers, took the empty liter bag, hooked it up to an IV, put an 18-gauge intercath into my antecubital vein, and I bled off a liter of blood. Went home, put it all over my flowers and roses. Went back in two days, had my blood tested again. My hemoglobin was 16 and a half. The doctor said, I don't believe this. It was, let, let me test it again. I said, okay, test it again. It was 16 and a half. He goes, that's strange. I said, well, maybe I was dehydrated, and that's why it went up. He said, oh, okay, fine. So even I had to deal with it, and even I couldn't address it adequately because they just simply don't understand. I actually had to go see an endocrinologist recently because I had to have some lab tests under insurance. The endocrinologist saw my old high hemoglobin and just blew a fuse. You're going to stroke out, man. Uh, yeah, 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 fine. I said, okay, I'll stop the testosterone. He asked me if I was on testosterone. I didn't tell him. Donor asked, if it's not harmful, do patients have symptoms of gynecomastia and worsened ED? The gynecomastia is due to the insulin resistance, the visceral fat that's causing the gynecomastia. That's where the breast fat comes from. And if you go to manboobs.com, you'll see men on testosterone decrease visceral fat and subcutaneous fat. Men on testosterone improve the sexual function. Men on anastrozole have that sexual function significantly inhibited because you're blocking estradiol. Pete Fotino's, hi Pete, uh, says, uh, thanks for the great talk, thank you, look forward to seeing you in Nebraska City, yes, I'm looking forward to Beyond Hormones. Do you still recommend applying transdermal cream to the scrotum? Yes. Uh, don't apply alcohol-based cream to the scrotum because it burns. Uh, remember the story, you know, if I'm driving home from a night shift in the ER and I can't keep awake and I'm falling asleep, I whip out the androgel, smear it on my scrotum, and I'm wide awake for the next half hour. If yes, which study shows that absorption is better on the scrotum versus the inner thigh? There's no study. It's just personal experience. Do it on yourself. Apply it to your inner thigh and then apply it to the scrotum, and you'll see the difference. You'll see that the levels can double or triple when you apply it to a mucous membrane. Where do you apply nitroglycerin? Under the tongue or under your arms? Uh, you apply it to a mucous membrane. That's why we apply it there, because it absorbs so much better. The PDR says don't apply it there because it's alcohol base. Mark asks, some testosterone therapists recommend slowly increasing the testosterone supplementation to avoid complications. Sure, you can do that. That's fine. You can do anything you want. Cheryl asks, although you prefer using testosterone cream, can you still comment on the best way to maintain steady, optimal testosterone level? Steady? What do you mean by steady? Um, everything is going to fall. If you use a transdermal cream, at 12 hours, it's going to fall. In 24 hours, it's back to 200. If you use a shot after seven days, it's back to 200. Use a pellet after three months, it's back to 200. So um, the best way that I would recommend uh, is a daily testosterone dose. Uh, and the way to do that, you, you can't really do it with an IM shot. You can't do it with pellets. Um, you use a transdermal cream, but make sure you enough, use enough of it. People say, well, I used it and it didn't work. Well, that's because people don't use enough of it and they don't maintain real good levels. Um, you don't want the levels to drop. Well, then you have to use a daily dose BID, then the levels won't drop. Steve asked, how high are you able to get testosterone with HCG? Not very high. What's the maximum dose of HCG that you use? 
Um, 500 international units per day, but again, if your testicles are old and worn out, they just won't work. You can't stimulate them um, more. They just won't work. That's why you can't use it in older men because it just does not work. I've only had one man over age 50 that was able to get reasonable levels up around 7 or 800 with HCG. Um, otherwise, you can't. Then you got to switch. Um, Sabatino asked, what about gynecomastia with high estrogen from testosterone? Lower the dose. Or use an astrozole. But when you look at the studies using an astrozole, it increases subcutaneous fat. There's different types of gynecomastia. One's nipple tenderness. One is a hard fat nodule. That's typically what is increased with testosterone. Subcutaneous fat, the, the fat that you get around your abdomen and subcutaneous area, that will decrease with testosterone use. Go to man boobs and look at and You'll see the testosterone melt away. You'll see the patient's that have significant fat loss when they use an adequate amount of testosterone. It does not increase it. If you're worried about it, then lower the dose. Steve asks, pros and cons to HCG versus clomiphene. I think uh, HCG works better. Clomiphene is much cheaper and it's oral. Um, clomiphene has negative estrogen effect, uh, correct, versus HCG. Clomiphene is a CIRM. It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator, um, which will block receptors on the hypothalamus. Um, which will then in turn increase production of your own um, um, gonadotropin releasing hormones. But it's just not as strong as um, HCG, which is, you know, pure FSH LH subunits, as opposed to clomiphene, which makes your own subunits go up. Uh, testosterone levels between the two, um, I've had more success raising testosterone levels with HCG, but it's much more expensive than clomiphene. Again, with HCG and the clomiphene, you reach a plateau above which using more does not help raise levels anymore. Allison says, I see some men whose testosterone levels don't rise as normal and they stay very low. Um, the levels are very low because they're not using it or because they metabolize it. But typically, it's because they don't use it or they don't absorb it. If you use enough of it and you apply it in the correct spot, the levels will go up. I do not see any man that uses it correctly and applies it correctly that I don't see really, really, really good levels. Jonathan Wright wrote a paper on hyperexcretion and using cobalt to keep the hormones in your body. Sure, you can do that. That's fine. You can do whatever you like. Do I see this? I don't know. Um, I don't do that. Um, and what do I do? Um, I just raise testosterone. Could you just keep increasing the testosterone dose until the symptoms are gone? Um, I hate to be redundant. Um, can you just keep increasing the insulin until the blood sugar gets normal? Do you keep increasing the pain medicine until the pain goes away? Um, do you keep you know, increasing the medicine until you get an effect? Well, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, but the numbers are high. Don't test the numbers. Mark says in women, is it harder to clinically determine the optimal testosterone dose? Yep. Um, Mark, if you figure out women, you'll get the Nobel Prize. Um, all women are different. They're all snowflakes, remember? All snowflakes are different. Um, some women need a very small amount. Some women need large amounts. Um, some women are somewhere in the middle. The lower the sex hormone binding globulin, the more insulin resistant they are. The higher the free testosterone, the more they're going to have side effects, both from high free testosterone as well as sensitivity to the hair follicle that they get with insulin resistance. Balancing weight loss and increased libido versus acne and skin thickening. Um, it's a balancing act. Um, that's true. Um, I use spinolactone to help decrease some of those symptoms. But, yeah, you have to balance it. You have to adjust it accordingly. Hi, Dr. German. Um, you've done over 4,000 pellet insertions um, with nonlinear decrease in testosterone levels, which maintain for four to five months. Um, me too, um, but I see a drop. And then a rapid drop. Um, I don't see a rapid drop. I see a gradual drop over a period of time. Most males get pellets in four to six months with dramatic results, me included. Good. I'm glad um, that you're getting good results with it. Denora asked, um, have you ever seen levels of 3,000 and higher in your patients? Yes. What if the level goes above 3,000? Oh, my God, you've got to lower the dose. That's way too high. Yes, I'm being sarcastic. Molly asks, if you raise testosterone dose to alleviate symptoms, are there any 
common adverse effects that you see. Yep, hemoglobin goes up. How do you address these things so that you can keep the dose as high as you need? You can phlebotomize. Sabatino asks, what milligrams should the transdermal be? Um, well, it depends on what type you're using um, and what pharmacy you're using and what your results are. So, you know, start with 100 milligrams and then adjust accordingly. Um, Cheryl says, do I see hair loss in women on testosterone? Typically not. Again, it's a saturation effect. But you certainly can um, if it's an individual sensitivity. Um, all women lose hair when they go through menopause. Um, it's just a fact. Um, and women are very upset with their hair loss. Um, so using testosterone typically does not result in hair loss due to the saturation effect. But if it's an issue, and many women lose hair even though they're not on testosterone, then you can adjust the dose and that you can also use spironolactone. Janora, thank you very much. You're very, very, very welcome. Estella asks, um, the use of chrysin, not good. You can use chrysin, that's fine. Chrysin is supposed to block aromatization into estradiol. So when you want to block estrogen, then go ahead and use an aromatase inhibitor or use chrysin. I don't know why you want to do that, but you can. Solomon says uh, to have good estrogen levels in testosterone placement therapy is good, yes, but what if it really goes high? How do you know it goes high? Well, because you tested it, okay? I can't answer that for you unless you get rid of the conformational bias of estradiol. <clears throat> which study, there's thousands of them, which study in the last 50 years, there's lots of meta-analysis, which study showed that they used est they measured estradiol? So if there's no study that suggests it, the PDR doesn't suggest it, the guidelines don't suggest it, AACE doesn't suggest it, urology guidelines don't suggest it, then why are you doing it? You don't want to use aromatase inhibitors. Um, what about a little bit of transdermal progesterone? Really? Um, Solomon, in part two, I reviewed the studies that show harmful effects of using uh, progesterone in men. Uh, Deepa asked, what is the optimum dose to get the 1,500 to 2,000 for medium-sized female? Um, I don't know what the optimum dose is. You have to prescribe it and then test it and then see what your levels are and see what your response is. So I, I don't know what the dose is because the dose is different in everyone. I, I can't give you. It's like saying, what's the optimum dose of insulin? I don't know. You've got to measure it and see what it is. I can't give you a, an exact number because there isn't one. Estella asked, um, I compound a lot of testosterone, chrysin, progesterone for those patients who are estrogen dominant based on estrogen metabolic test. Um, Metabolic syndrome is due to insulin resistance. It's the insulin resistance that causes increase in visceral fat that increases estrogen. It's not the estrogen that causes the visceral fat. In every study, when we give estradiol, it lowers visceral fat. Giving estradiol does not increase visceral fat. Visceral fat will increase production of estrone, which will increase production of estradiol. Get rid of the visceral fat. If you try to block estradiol in men and you try to block estradiol in women, it will increase visceral fat. Look at the studies that show that. Show me the study that blocking estradiol in men and women decreases visceral fat. In women, every study, when you go into menopause and lose estradiol, you gain fat. In every study, when you give estradiol back, it reduces visceral fat. So do I use chrysin to block estradiol? No, I want the estradiol. Do I use progesterone in men? Really? Where did you learn that? Go ask them. Well, they taught us at A4M. They taught us at AMMG. Um, I taught you the harm of what happens when you block estradiol and the harm of what happens when you block progesterone. I can find no study in men where it's beneficial to give progesterone or block estradiol. Every study shows harm, no study shows good, but you still want to do it. I don't get it. Well, because someone said. 
<laughs> Jennifer asked, what's the highest dose you've used in transdermal cream for a man? Um, I don't know, two or three grams. Sandy says, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for thanking. Estella asked, so you don't bother giving patients salt palmetto to men with enlarged prostate? You can. You can give salt palmetto. That's fine. Most studies showed it didn't work. The study in JAMA showed that it did work. If you're going to use salt palmetto, you have to use a pharmaceutical grade that you can get through a compounding pharmacy. Um, there's a really neat paper out recently that was in, um, I think, the Journal of Urology or the Journal of Prostate. I can't remember which one it was. And it addressed BPH in men. Um, guess how they treated BPH in men? Guess what drug worked well to decrease symptoms of BPH? It's not a drug, it's a hormone. Guess what hormone reduces BPH symptoms? Guess what symptoms got worse? when they blocked that hormone. Symptoms got better with estradiol. Symptoms were worsened when you blocked estradiol. I'm just, don't shoot the messenger boy. I'm just telling you what the study showed. You still can't get it out of your brain because of confirmational bias, because you heard and you read and you learned that. I can't fix your confirmational bias. For those people that didn't hear that and didn't learn it, it's great. I love teaching the part one course for the American Academy of Family Practice. I just love it. Because when I start off, I go, how many of you people have been to A4M and AMMG? Nobody raises their hands. Does anyone ever hear about using progesterone in men? Nobody raises their hand. Anyone hear about blocking estrogen in men? Nobody raises their hand. Whew. No confirmational bias. By looking at all of your questions, you're focused on, I got to block that estradiol. Three quarters of your questions are based on, you got to block estradiol. What levels do you see improved cognition in elderly suffering from dementia? Um, levels of what? I, I don't know. Um, last year, Beyond Hormones, we looked at estradiol reversing plaque, um, and that means beta amyloid protein in women, and symptomatic improvement in women that have Alzheimer's disease. Um, we saw the study in part one where giving thyroid to youth thyroid individuals improves cognition and memory. Um, I don't know what level improves cognition in men and testosterone. I don't think it's really been looked at. Gasell says, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much for thanking. Uh, you always keep us on track. You're the best. Well, I wish my wife said I was the best. But anyway, um, Jessica, take the leap and go to part one. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, I probably am not aware that people haven't taken the courses. And I guess there are some listeners that haven't taken the courses and don't know the evidence-based literature and don't know all the studies. Uh, I guess I probably should have addressed that, and I didn't. Thanks for pointing that out, Jessica. Kayla says, uh, remind me what treatment to use for hair loss in men. Um, Dutasteride, 0.5 milligrams, is a 5-alpha-1 reductase inhibitor as opposed to 5-alpha-2, which is finasteride. It works best. Uh, and then you can use minoxidil, and you can use eucopril or fluoridil. I have some super fussy male patients who do not like their hair loss. Yeah, I know. Tell them to change their parents next time and get different genes. Um, but otherwise, um, those that I mentioned are the best treatment. Um, Desmond asked, any concern at treating a 90-year-old with huge prostate and urinary symptoms, long-standing PSA of 20, obviously long-term BPH, prostatosis, prostatitis, and worsening symptoms due to uh, increased DHT rise. Um, if you look at the meta-analysis on what lower urinary tract symptoms, and there's quite a few recent meta-analyses looking at LUTs, men on testosterone improve in their symptoms. Um, symptoms get worse in those that were on placebo. So there's a multitude of studies show improvement in lower urinary tract symptoms with testosterone administration. We have what somebody took it and got worse. Well, that's because most men um, have BPH and LUTs. Um, what about the huge prostate? Do I have any concern about treating them? No, um, I don't. I think that the symptoms will probably improve. 
Um, I've actually used estradiol in a couple men with really, really bad um, prostatitis, prostatosis, um, and their symptoms improved dramatically. Terry asks, maybe a better question, where do you start with dose in an average 50-year-old uh, male with no um, major diseases? Um, the average dose that I start with depends on the type of testosterone that I'm using. Um, so all of that is reviewed in part one. It's an hour-long lecture. Sorry to skirt your question, um, but it depends on which type, where you're applying it, which one that you're using as to the different doses. Harry, um, when can we get a copy of the testosterone consent form? Um, yeah, I actually forgot to include that. Um, the consent form is not looked at by an attorney. It's not legal advice. It's advice that you need to go over with your attorney, but it's things that I include um, when I prescribe testosterone. It's things that I mention and I have the patient sign in their chart. Um, I will get a copy of the consent form to Mary, and you can email Mary, and Mary can forward that to you. Chris says, Anil, your observations on the intrusion of the FDA in the practice of medicine cannot be repeated too often. Yeah, I know. Um, but, but people think um, because the FDA made or changed their FDA approval, um, they think that that restricts the use of it. Well, no, it, it restricted the approval process it doesn't mean you can't use it or prescribe it. The FDA cannot dictate medicine. They can't tell you what you can and cannot do. That's not the responsibility. The responsibility is to make sure that the medicine is safe and is FDA approved for the indication for which it was studied. The practice of medicine is left to the physician. But unfortunately, AACE guidelines, but again, a guideline is a suggestion. It's a recommendation. It's not a hard and fast rule. AMA says you can use it for off-label use for any circumstances as long as you document the reasoning behind it. Just simply document and you can use it. Scott says you're an anesthesiologist. This also is treated just like anesthesia. Everything is anesthesia's fault. <laughs> yeah, I know. Isn't that something? All the doctors want to blame everything on testosterone, but they shouldn't. Um, Martin asked, um, what's the most effective indirect booster of testosterone? I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, next question, um, Dr. Veligdan asks, is there ever a reason to use IM instead of transdermal? Um, not really. Um, the reason for not using transdermal is because they don't see a benefit or an effect with it. If they don't see a benefit or an effect, it's because you're not using a high enough dose of it. Um, what's the starting dose that you use for transdermal testosterone cream? One gram. Denora says, scrotum is not mucous membrane, but absorption is different. Well, men, um, women have a vagina, which is mucous membrane. Scrotum is not mucous membrane, but very close to it. It's a markedly thin skinned area that will absorb very much the same as a mucous membrane does. Does chrysin also increase visceral fat? I don't know. Um, Steve, hi, Neil. I finished... Um, I assume it's um, parts one through four. Um, it's been, we'll be starting step one again. Um, yeah, it, it, does, it does change, there are updates. Uh, sorry for perhaps asking um, the same question in, in different um, form. Are you saying that um, I found no real bump in levels um, between HCG 500 and 1,000 per day? Um, minimally, um, not significant to increase the cost of 150 per month to 300 per month, but you certainly can, yes. Uh, any side effect other than the cost of, of going to 1,000 to 1,500? No, absolutely no, um, no side effect whatsoever. Um, Chris asks, how do I remain so incredibly patient? Um, drugs, um, more drugs. Um, and the fact that you're probably not aware, I got in from China at 3 o'clock this morning. Um, right now, even though it's noontime, your time, it's actually 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning for me, so I'm still asleep. Um, so I guess that is why. Anyway, 
Um, thanks for your vote of confidence and my tongue-in-cheek sarcasm, yes. Um, thanks for spreading the good word on the subject. I hope it's beneficial to all. Um, and, you know, this has actually been two hours. I've been talking for two hours straight now. Um, and it's hard for me to give a lecture in the courses um, and address all of the issues and concerns that we've addressed, which is why I, I do the, the webinars. Um, this is Bella. Um, with Steve, um, not to deviate too much, but quick question: uh, Women that are obese uh, shows an FSH LH flip a two. Okay, well then they're P they have PCOS insulin resistant. Slightly low T3. Not only is it low free T3, but it's also receptor site resistant at the cell level. We saw that in part three that there's significant resistance to T3 in women that have insulin resistance. Borderline insulin resistance score. It really doesn't matter. Women can have normal insulin levels and still be severely, um, have significant uh, PCOS. Um, we will do your titration of metformin, start with thyroid, debating on progesterone. Um, well, if they're having symptoms of PMS, use it. If they're anovulatory, if they have a severe flip and they're not menstruating regularly, then definitely use it for breast cancer, uterine cancer protection. Um, I forgot whether you do a week every month um, no, I take it continuously. You can cycle them off if you want to, um, but um, I don't because when you try to cycle them, then they complain of symptoms when they're off of the progesterone when they stop it for the week. So I just continue it, you know, for 30 days a month and increase it based on their PMS symptoms. If they're not having any PMS symptoms, then I take it daily continuously for 30 days. Um, the Again, tongue-in-cheek response is, on the days when you don't want to protect against uterine cancer and breast cancer, then don't take the progesterone. Good. See you again at part one. Uh, Tom Haddon uh, says, uh, thank you. Your patience with those who haven't trained with you or were not uh, listening is admirable. Yeah. Um, you know, we were all newbies at one time. Um, I, I just forgot that there were newbies uh, listening um, for the first time and they haven't taken the courses and, and probably they're, they think I'm coming from left field and they don't understand um, where I'm coming from on, on, the, on my answers. Sabatino says, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for thanking. Um, hope to see you next webinar. Todd, where you been? Um, how would I treat a 55-year-old obese smoker male with claudication symptoms with testosterone? How would I treat him? Um, first of all, try to get him to stop smoking. Um, that requires professional help. Um, similar to narcotics, um, it's going to be difficult to get people off of tobacco. Use the testosterone. How would I treat an obese man? Very aggressively, very high-dose testosterone, high-dose thyroid, DHEA, tender loving care, um, professional advice on diet, nutrition, supplementation, um, and if you can certainly afford it, growth hormone. Donora says, thanks very much. Thank you very much, too. Okay, everyone, it's over two hours. Uh, goodbye, good luck. Thank you very much. See you next month at next month's webinar. Hope it was fun. Thank you all very much. I'll keep this brief, but uh, we will include a copy of the slides, and at the end of the slides are all the references that uh, Neil used today. So thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys.